This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is uh, season six, episode 11 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name is Chris Abraham, and I am trying out a new recorder, uh, a battery-fed, battery-fed Olympus Pearl Quarter, and methinks it's, uh, it's made in Vietnam, batteries, uh, two triple A's, and it is called a digital voice recorder, WS-853. It's pretty old school, kind of like it, and I gave my other Sony to my buddy John, who might or might not lose control of his dad's estate as his dad is suffering from various and sundry uh, chronic illnesses and uh, brain fades. And so I gave him my recorder so that every time he interacts with his dad, he can record the situational ambience of the conversation and so forth, just so that if the man who is living the roommates of his dad, if his dad's roommate exerts the will to become uh, the, I don't know, the controller of his dad's estate and blocks Don from his, uh, his control of the estate, at least there'll be some uh, evidence that that's the case. This is Chris Abraham, season six, episode 11 of the Chris Abraham Show, welcome. It is beautiful today in sexy South Arlington. It is uh, cur- currently 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It is, uh, it is November 8th, 2023. And I am uh, seeing what it's like to record via uh, a lapel mic versus directly on the device. I don't think it's going to go badly because I run everything through Adobe uh, AI filter. So it'll probably sound fine. So today, I'm going to appall you with my whataboutism, with my lack of moral clarity, with my uh, understanding that people do completely predictable shit all the time, and that you can pretty much predict all behaviors, and, uh, and morality is just your response to uh, whether you want something to happen or don't want something to happen. So, to show you how moralistic I am, that's my belief. Uh, So, Israel and Palestine. I have known since the 70s in my pre-10s, like I was born in 1970s, so even I was aware in the late 70s, based on the stories that I heard from my New York City mom and dad about a couple called Nair and Eddie, who lived in, I believe, Jerusalem, and uh, during the 70s and 80s, they were constantly being bombed. Their markets were being bombed. Their public buses were being bombed. Their public squares were being bombed. Their cafes were being bombed. And they were under a constant rocket attack. That's outside of the uh, various wars and conflicts. And ergo, uh, my experience of hearing and going to college in the late 80s as originally a political science uh, major, I knew that the two most, the three most dangerous countries in the world were Russia, in that time it was the Soviet Union, uh, Israel, and the United States. Though at that time the United States came third because when in the 70s and 80s, when extremists were uh, plane jacking, were Um, jacking and taking commercial aircraft and having them rerouted or holding them hostage and holding them ransom and holding the people inside hostage. It was routine that the Russians and the Israelis, who actually wouldn't negotiate with terrorists, would just, at the very most, blow up the commercial airline. And at the very least, Russian uh, Spetsnaz or Mossad uh, operatives and shoot up the inside, get rid of all the hijackers and probably a lot of people who were on the airplane. 
In the 70s, in 1970, when I was born in America, most Americans were uh, given uh, brisses, if you will. And I believe that was always to kind of make it harder for uh, anti-Jewish extremists to find out who was or wasn't Jewish based on uh, the on whether or not they did or didn't have foreskin. So it was an obfuscation strategy. And it was known through the 80s when I was aware that uh, Israel would always respond to any kind of uh, suicide bombing or suicide bomber or terrorist or active terror uh, killer, be it Palestinian or just anybody who is anti-Israel, with a very brief alert to the entire city block of the family that a particular suicide bomber was associated with or terrorist was associated with. And within an hour or two, uh, the entire city block would be raised generally by Apache or Cobra uh, cannon fire. And so anybody who initiates an attack against Israel is pretty much going to initiate a uh, raised response, R-A-Z, R-A-Z-E-D. So, and as I said on social media, the Israelis have decided a long time ago what their conversion rate is between Palestinians and Israelis. Before October 7th, there was sort of this understanding, and it was said almost with mirth that um, Israel was willing to release a thousand Palestinians from jails in order to have one kidnapped Israeli released. So we agree, or it's agreed, that in general, comma, the conversion rate is a thousand to one. Now that might be inflated after October 7th, um, but let's go with a thousand to one. And let's, let's just say that there were 1,700 Israeli Jews that were killed on October 7th. Now, 1,000. Now, based on the conversion rate, you would think that in order to release one Jew, one Israeli Jew, they would release 1,000 Palestinians. So the conversion rate towards life is 1,000 to 1. But the conversion rate to death is a thousand to one too. So it goes both ways. So if you kill one Israeli Jew, then vengeance would, based on that conversion rate, be a thousand Palestinians dead. Not Hamas, just Palestinians. Because those 1,700 dead are not uh, soldiers. They were not people in uniform. They were not people in body armor with uh, M4s. They were they were ravers. They were people in their house. They were men, women, and children. So this conversion rate isn't between Hamas in Israel. This conversion rate is between Gazians and Israelis. So based on a thousand to one conversion, that means that Israel feels the vengeance of 1.7 million souls taken from Gaza in order to make it right, quote unquote. So this was predictable. This was this is why there's so much hearts and minds warfare to try to make this not happen. Because everybody knows, historically speaking, that when you, when you fight someone who has a lot to live for and expects a long life, you probably can deal with proportionality. But when you deal with anybody who believes that there's an existential threat, they're always likely to go straight for the, uh, go straight for the nuclear option. Bad analogy, but growing up as an only child in Hawaii, I never knew what being a fucking Howley meant. I didn't have, I had a mom and dad who were working. I didn't have brothers and sisters, uncles or cousins to kind of get my back. So whenever I was cornered and whenever I knew that there was going to be a fight ensuing, which of course was always defined by the guy taking off his shirt, I would brutally, 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 out of proportion viciously assault that person until they were on the ground twitching. Then I would stop. So when the, when the threat was completely rendered threatless, then I would cease. 
or whenever, whenever somebody would kind of hold me back, which never happened because I didn't have a bunch of dudes on my side. When I was in my fraternity in college, I was at Odds, our local bar, and my Phi Kappa Psi brothers uh, were there, and I was hitting on a girl. Just so happened that girl was called dibs for by a uh, an active duty DC based Marine, and I never knew what it was like to have a posse. Um, but the guy came over to me and did that thing where he was gonna. He at least said he was gonna beat me to shit for hitting on his girlfriend, wife, lover, or just someone he wanted to be with. And within seconds, before I even had a chance to put down my drink and stand up, my brothers had beat the shit out of him, and he was on the ground. And when the ambulance came, uh, they put a cuff on his neck because his neck might have been broken. And I vaguely recall someone stomping on his neck. Wasn't me, but my fraternity was activated and within three seconds the threat was uh was was removed so everybody's completely appalled by the response of russia to ukraine and everybody's completely appalled by the response of israel to gaza and to palestine and i would say that both of these behaviors considering that Israel was founded as a Haole in Hawaii by itself to sort of not belonging there with everybody hating them, or at least that's the narrative that they have. And it's a historical narrative that goes 3,000 years back. And any time you take up arms or try to do anything violent towards someone who has nothing to lose or feels like they are experiencing an existential threat of their very existence, they will always respond 10,000 times out of proportion to the initial attack. For me, all I saw was that this was going to be really bad in my head. I didn't know. He might have just been wanting to spar, like to see who, to see what I was made of. But I literally thought that he wanted to kill me, this guy. Not the Marine, but back in Hawaii. So I would... Because I didn't feel like I was safe, I, I fought with ferocity using all of my weight, all of my size, all of my advantage. And it probably reduced very quickly to knocking over and fierce kicking, right? So uh, I got a reputation after that. Nobody ever effed with me on the entire island after that behavior. And I heard people say things like, Oh, Chris, he's cool, but the fucking guy's crazy, you know. And that was the result. The result was is that I might, nobody forevermore might have perceived me as, as sane or safe or kind or whatever, or even have respect for me. But there was an understanding that I was, um, as they say in Taiwan, I had a certain level of, uh, of uh, what is it, porcupine, I had a porcupine effect. People knew that I was either poisonous or dangerous or lethal. Um, that for me, words were violence and violence needs to be ended quickly in order to prevent uh, greater violence. And the moment my mom gave me, for my family, which was super expensive, $2,000 worth of uh, beautiful teeth with braces, all of my behavior was to make sure that nothing would ever happen to my teeth. So, on the other hand, Israel is incapable of realizing that it is, in fact, fomenting an environment where they seem to be much more Nazi, much more fascist than the people in the uh, ghetto that is known as, as the Gaza Strip. There is no doubt at all that Gaza to Israel is beyond the pale and according to everybody the level of oppression that they're doing against the Palestinians in both the Gaza and the West Bank in terms of walling in terms of restriction in terms of carrying green or blue passes is the equivalent of finding of the the Germans in the 30s requiring the Jews to wear yellow stars of david's on their arms and or putting 
descriptions on businesses saying, you know, you'd, you didn't. So when you put a people into a pressure cooker in a land that they believe to be their homeland, in a land that they believe to be their ancestral inheritance, then they will be in a pressure cooker, uh, especially if they believe that that land is Arabic land, that land is Muslim land, that land is their homeland, and that they're being treated like prisoners in their homeland. And they also have been making more babies than any, than any township, than any region in the entire Middle East. So ergo, my uncle had a fish and the fish type was called an Oscar. And an Oscar is a particularly, uh, I don't know, omnivorous, carnivorous fish. And it'll eat, if it gets big enough, you can just put a, a mouse in there, a little eat a mouse or whatever. Funny thing about an Oscar is that it will always grow to the size of its tank. Now, Gaza and the Gazians haven't done the Japan or Italian thing where they uh, stop making babies because of the limitations of resources in the, uh, the Gaza Strip. Instead, there have been more babies made. That's why no matter where you throw a bomb, where you throw a missile, where you throw a rocket, where you throw a bullet, uh, you're going to hit Palestinian baby because Gaza is like 80% babies. And as a result of that kind of super pressure, you can literally, if, if you treat another people with as much inhumane disrespect and dismissal as the Germans are perceived of treating the Jews during World War II, you can be a Jew in Israel and be accused of being a Nazi, of literally being a German Nazi in your anti-Semitism against Palestinian Arabs, because Arabs are Semites as well. Arabs are Semites, just like Jews are Semites. So there is a global perception that the Palestine Palestinians have taken over the herald of being the most victimized people in the world at present moment. And instead of being Semitic, uh, Israeli Jews are seen as blonde haired, blue eyed, if you will, de facto white people, de facto colonials, de facto imperialists, de facto white devils, uh, de facto fascists, de facto capitalists, de facto degenerates, uh, de facto, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a flip, you know, when you're used to being the people who died to the point of 7 million during the Holocaust, you're not used to or prepared to be recast as literally Goebbels or literally, uh, Adolf Hitler. So there's a little bit of, uh, of dis dissonance going on in this confusion about whether one is the victimizer or one is the victim and how many victims can, and, and sort of it's like, um, as we call it, Jen Ken Po, but I think it's called rock, paper, scissors. There's a game of rock, paper, scissors over who gets to be the biggest victim in the region. Is it the Jews in Israel who are the biggest victim in the region because they're surrounded by a billion Muslims? Or are they the victimizer who are captivating, literally uh, imprisoning and ethnically cleansing uh, a population of 2.5 million Palestinians who, according to the world, have rightful claim to the Holy Land. So, so see, right? Like both sides could easily predict what was going to happen next. Um, right now, I can tell you that Bibi Netanyahu and his uh, posse are wondering why they didn't uh, raise all Palestinians and ethnically cleanse them in the 60s, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when they had um, a unique lock to their existential crisis, their, uh, their right to exist, and they had 
a certain level of complete dominance over the message and the messaging. And they are regretting what they think of as their mercy and their humanity. And they regret even being willing to entertain the two-state solution. And now uh, they're contemplating whether or not they're going to uh, raise the entire peoples of uh, Palestine in the same way that the Ukraine is being completely raised of all Ukrainians and blamed on the Russians, though this could have been easily prevented. And honestly, in terms of proportionality, no Russian civilians uh, who didn't put themselves into Ukraine physically, ver virtually no Russian civilians have ever been in a threat during this entire war. But all Ukrainians have been in a threat during this war because the bombs are mostly in the war and the bombs are mostly only going into Ukraine. So that's not a fair fight. That just seems like shooting uh, fish in a barrel. And by fish, I mean Ukrainian. So uh, will this make the argument uh, that Crystal Ball had in, uh, in um, uh, Breaking Points podcast is that this will just make uh, America unsafer and Israel unsafer. But let me bring back to you this existential threat and this feeling that um, Israel's normal is the normal historically where they will have uh, bombings and rocketings, that they will have uh, suicide bombers and they will have limpet mine explosions on cars and they will have um, various and sundry shootings, right? So, so that's the normal place. Um, America will be different. America has never seen domestic terrorism unless you like play games and call um, inner city crime terrorism or if you call uh, very rare school shooting, shootings terrorism or if you just call the idea of a bunch of white people with guns as terrorism, then there's terrorism. But if you literally think about the 1980s that I lived in where um, many places in London were being blown up by the IRA and many discotheques in Spain were being blown up by uh, separatist groups there, uh, America is completely immune to any post 9-11 blowback. There hasn't been anything, knock on wood, that's happened at all, zero, after all the immigrants, after all the open borders, after a shameless attack on Syria, shameless attack on Afghanistan, shameless attack on, uh, on, on Iraq, shameless attack um, uh, in uh, humiliations into Pakistan, humiliations into uh, Libya, like all of these behaviors, all of these crushing attacks have had zero consequences in America. So doing it more has never resulted in a negative feedback. America has never gotten black eye since 9-11. Uh, arguably, 9-11 wasn't even a black eye. 9-11 was uh, an impetus to war. And Israel is used to black eyes. So... They don't know what to do if they look in the mirror and don't see a bloody nose, a black eye, and, uh, and maybe, you know, a, uh, a nasty, bleeding uh, scalp laceration. So on that note, um, there's no incentive to do anything else. Yes, there are extreme levels of anti-Semitism being manifest now, and there are extreme levels of, uh, of, um, of um, Islamophobia going on as well. And uh, until that becomes literally uh, bombs, limpid mines, assassinations, and uh, my local cafes exploding in shards and being uh, closed up with large pieces of, uh, of, of, of uh, balsa wood and yellow tape, then it's all, just, it's all just smoke and mirrors. It's all just fear porn, fear mongering, and I don't believe it. Um, I'm more likely to be mugged, carjacked. Uh, I'm more likely to have my car stolen or my uh, stuff from my car or under my car stolen. 
And I'm much more likely, if I own a storefront, to have a smash and grab or to have looting than I am uh, to have anything remotely called as actual domestic terrorism. So on that note, this is episode 11, season 6 of The Chris Abraham Show. Um, aloha, mahalo, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.